are winter people. Say amen. amen. All right. Well, we have a deliverance service right after here. <laughs> amen. And we will be praying for you. Amen. Um, no. There are some people that love winter. Amen. And so God bless them. Praise the Lord. Um, but uh, I thank God that there is a change in the season. A change in our season is taking place. Somebody say amen. amen. The seasons are changing, in other words. And so I believe that not only are the seasons changing in the natural, but the seasons are changing spiritually as well. And so I want to challenge those of you that are here today, all you beautiful people, and I want to challenge those that are watching us online as well. You know, as I was praying early, early in the wee hours of the morning this past week, um, I felt the Lord give me a word for this particular season that we are all in. I'm going to ask you to please uh, do not allow anything or anyone to distract you. Please turn off your uh, phones or put them on silence, amen, so that it will not uh, in any way um, hamper anyone's ability to, to stay attentive to the word of the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. Today I want to deal with a part of the Word of God, a part of the Bible that speaks about Joseph. You know, Joseph was a very interesting character. Somebody say Joseph. Joseph, Joseph was a very interesting character. In fact, um, the Bible teaches us that there's a lot of similarities uh, between Joseph and between Jesus. In fact, whenever we read the story of Joseph, there are a lot of correlations between Jesus and the life of Joseph. In other words, Joseph and Jesus had a lot of things in common. And in fact, Joseph in the Bible, and when I say Joseph, I'm not speaking about the husband of Mary, uh, but I'm speaking about the son, the youngest son of Jacob, who later became Israel. So we're dealing with a, an Old Testament character. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the life of Joseph. I'm going to ask for your undivided attention. I'm going to try to give you a quick synopsis or a quick uh, background, if you will, of the life of Joseph. But I want you to apply your mind, your heart, and your understanding. And listen, do not allow anything, anything to distract you as we go forward. Because I believe that there is a prophetic edge to this message today. Those of you online, we welcome you as I mentioned. The Bible teaches us that Joseph came unexpectedly into the life of Jacob. And when I say unexpectedly, I mean he wasn't expecting to have another child. In fact, the Bible teaches that Jacob was of age. In other words, he was older. It was his latter years. And in his latter years, his wife becomes pregnant. And here you have the news that Jacob will be a father yet once again. And the Bible teaches us that Jacob named his son Joseph. And it says that he loved Joseph more than all of his sons. That's right. Jacob had a favorite son. So there was an aspect of favoritism, if you will, in the family. And this was resented by all of his brothers. All of his older brothers resented Joseph. Why? Because he was the youngest. And it was obvious that his father loved him more than he loved any of them. You know, my children always talk to one another and they say that they are daddy's or dad's favorite. Okay? And so you'll have Faith saying she's the favorite. You'll have uh, Katie saying she's the favorite. And of course, if you ask the girls, Aaron's my favorite. And uh, if uh, you ask Aaron, then Ethan's my favorite. And it, the, the bottom line is, I love them all alike. All of them. There is no favoritism, not in our house, even though my children would beg to differ. However, in Joseph's family, there was favoritism. It wasn't a hidden thing. In fact, the Bible says that, jo that Jacob 
in order to place on Joseph this favor, he had a, uh, a coat that was knit together. It was made, and it was a beautiful coat. It was known as the coat, the coat of many colors, the coat of many colors, because it was filled with all of these ornate and uh, bright colors, just a beautiful uh, array of colors. And so can you imagine, here you have this 17 year old, because that's how old he was. He was 17 years old. He's favored by his dad. He has this coat, and he's just sporting this coat after he put it on. Come on. And his brothers are looking at him. They already hated him without the coat. Now they can't stand him with the coat. Because now it's a mark of his favor. Come on, somebody. Say amen to that. How many of you know that God has marked you with favor? I said God has marked you with favor. God has marked you with favor, and the devil can't stand it. So here you have... The brothers and they couldn't stand their younger brother Joseph. One day their brothers went out to hunt and so they were taking a long time. They weren't coming back uh, as of yet. It was late in the day and the father says, uh, Joseph I want you to go please and take your brothers some food. And Joseph said, oh sure, no problem. So he went and the Bible says that when they saw him coming, they were enraged and they said, look who's coming, uh, the favored of our father. And the Bible says that their heart was filled with hatred. Where did this hatred come from? I mean, how did they end up hating him? Was it just the coat of many colors or was it something more? Well, it was something more. The Bible teaches that Joseph started having dreams and these dreams were very real to him and they were very spiritual. And they were God-given dreams. But the problem with Joseph was that he started telling his brothers his dreams. you got to be very careful who you share your dreams with. And not only who you share them with, but you have to be very careful when you share your dreams. Because sometimes when you share a dream and it is not the right time for you to share the dream, or it is not God's will for you to share the dream, it can really turn and bite you in the end. How many know what I'm talking about? So what Joseph would end up doing all the time was telling the brothers the dream in the morning the moment he woke up. He's like, wow, this is amazing. I got another dream. And then he would go and tell his brothers, hey, I had a dream. And uh, this was the dream. Uh, I saw that there were certain bushels. And there were seven bushels or 12 bushels or however many bushels. And the Bible says that I saw all the bushels bowing down to uh, my bushel. Okay. And so what they read into that right away was, oh, so you're saying that we're going to bow down to you? And that we're going to end up serving you or, or, or we're going to end up somehow uh, subservient to you? Now, he didn't say that that's what it was, but they read into it. And then they ha he had another dream, and the dream pointed to the same thing. He started talking about the moon and the sun and the stars and so on and so forth. And what ends up happening is that they read the same message, and they said, look at this guy. On top of the fact that he's dad's favorite, on top of the fact that he's already ha has dad's heart, and most likely is going to get a bigger inheritance than we are, well, uh, what's going on here? So they plotted to kill him. And sure enough, he's coming. Minding his own business, he's going to go to his brothers. He thinks that they're going to be happy to see him because he's bringing food. But they're already talking before he gets there. And they said, we're going to kill him. That's right. We're going to kill him and uh, we're just going to make up some story. Uh, Reuben, thank God for Reuben. Reuben was w one of the oldest sons. Now watch this. Reuben said to himself, i got to save my younger brother's life here. Reuben was clearly outnumbered by the rest of them. And they could have easily turned on Reuben. So Reuben was trying to preserve himself and his younger brother. So he says, let me think. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell them not to kill him, but rather throw him in a pit. And so he goes and tells his brother, listen, he's flesh and blood just like us. And this is going to devastate our dad. So why don't you just simply throw him in the pit? That's it, just throw him there. 
you know, he'll learn his lesson. Well, they ended up throwing him in the pit. They started sitting down and eating and just kind of, you know, uh, it was already late. And all of a sudden, a caravan, a caravan comes by. And they're on their way to Egypt. And they have slaves that are all chained up. So they got the bright idea, let's sell our brother. Let's sell him, take his coat, and just kill a lamb or kill some kind of animal. Put the blood, soak it with blood, so that we can go back and tell our father that this is what we found. Uh, it must be that Joseph was killed and mauled to death by some beast in the field. So that's what they did. They ended up selling him for 20 pieces of silver. The reason why it was 20 pieces of silver is because that's how much a teenager was worth back then. It was 20 pieces of silver. Your age bracket determined your worth as a slave. So they ended up selling him for 20 pieces of silver. There goes the dreamer. There goes the young man who was favored by his father. Now he is en route to Egypt, where he's going to be sold on the slave market. Well, sure enough, he gets to Egypt, and when he's in Egypt, they put him on the slave market. They're starting to sell and sell and sell humans. It was literally a market of human flesh, if you will, bodies, people, amen, slavery. And so what ends up happening is that part of Potiphar, who is the right hand of the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh was like the president of Egypt, here you have Potiphar who is in charge of the palace. He's in charge of everything pretty much that Pharaoh gives him authority over, which is, which is pretty much all the kingdom. He's looking for a slave. He's looking for someone because he needs someone in his palace. And he goes and he looks and he sees this young 17-year-old young man. And one thing you have to understand about Joseph is whenever the Bible describes you, the Bible is written by the, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So if God says something about you, you can bank on it. It's true. There's no embellishment, no exaggeration. It is what it is. Somebody say amen. amen. So how does God describe Joseph in the Bible? Well, listen to this. The Bible says that Joseph was very handsome. Not just handsome, you all. He was very handsome. So I want you to picture this young man, 17 years old, very handsome young man. But not only was he handsome, the Bible says that he was physically built. And his body was also very, very attractive. Now I want you to imagine, no, don't imagine that, please. Okay, um, let's, let's move on. Okay, L ladies, we're, we're in a holy place, amen. This is a holy place, okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. So here you have this young man. He's built. He's handsome. He's chiseled. Come on, somebody. Joseph wasn't just some rinky-dinky little, you know, servant, right? Yes, master. No, he was, he, 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 he lit up a room whenever he came in. Why do you think your, their, his brothers hated him? So what ends up happening? Potiphar is there. And Potiphar says, you know, he'll, he'll look nice in my, in my palace. He, he looks, he looks uh, uh, fit, physically fit, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to buy him. Uh, so he ends up buying him, ends up putting him in his palace. And the Bible says that there was favor on Joseph. Everybody say favor real loud. Favor. There was favor on this young man. It was God's favor. God favored him. Not only did he have favor from his father, but he had favor from his heavenly father as well. And this favor accompanied him everywhere he went. Is there an amen in the house? So the Bible says that Potiphar put him in his palace and he began to grow in favor, in stature. And what ends up happening is that Potiphar now elevates him to the manager or the administrator of the entire palace. So now this young man, after being there just a few years, hear this now, is literally running the palace. He has favor everywhere he goes. He is the right hand now of Potiphar, which is the second or the right hand of 
the king of Egypt. Can you imagine this? So now he goes from a slave to a servant in the palace. Well, it's not long that something else starts happening to him. The Bible says that Potiphar's wife, who was also very attractive, she noticed him. And it's interesting because the Bible doesn't say she noticed him right away. But she noticed him after some time. And so when she noticed him, she desired him. She wanted to sleep with him. That's what the Bible says. That she wanted to sleep with him. And so the Bible says that she went and she told him. But I love his response. Joseph said, you know, my master has made me in charge of his entire household. And I have authority in the entire palace. But I don't have authority over you. And I don't have. He never gave you to me. He never allowed me. He never would allow me. You are his wife. And he put her in her place. How many praise God for men of conviction? Men of principle. Men that that understand their call, come on somebody, and the anointing and the favor on their life. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. The devil knew that Joseph was a man of dreams. Not only did the brothers hear the dreams, but Lucifer heard the dreams as well. And Lucifer knew that God had great plans for this young man. The same way that God has great plans for you. God has purpose for your life. He has plans for your life. Plans that right now may not be evident, may not be obvious. Maybe you're 17 years old. Maybe you're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 25. Maybe you're in your youth right now. And you can't see the plans God has for you. But God will always speak to you. He'll always bring you into an atmosphere. He'll always bring you into an environment where you're reminded that you have worth. Where you're reminded that God has great plans. He'll usually speak to you through your parents. Speak to you through your mother, through your father. Speak to you through a friend. Speak to you through somebody telling you you're not just anybody. You're not just called to be uh, trying to make it in life. But God has great plans for your life. He's called you. He's anointed you. He has already appointed you. Is there an amen in the house? You see, the devil knows... He knows because he was in God's planning center when he was planning out your days. So he knows that God has great plans for you. God knows that he has great plans for my youngest, Ethan. I know he may not see it. In fact, if you ask him, he might see himself doing a whole lot of other things in life. But it doesn't change God's plans for his life. Same thing for Aaron. Same thing for Faith. Same thing for Caitlin. My children are destined by the Lord. My children have already had their life planned out as far as the victories. Come on, somebody. As far as the assignments in their life. Even as far as the people that they're going to share life with. Somebody say amen. But the same way. That the devil tried to detour or to rob Joseph of his plans and purpose and destiny is the same way he'll try with mine and he'll try with yours. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Watch this now. So the Bible says that Potiphar's wife, she looked at him and she wanted him. And she told him straight out. And he rejected her straight out. But this is very key in the story. Everyone listen to this. This is very key in the story. And it's key in your story. And that's this. The Bible says that Potiphar's wife came every day. And every day she was trying to sleep with him. Can you imagine going to work, waking up in the morning, going to work, only to be facing temptation every single day? Can you imagine Joseph going every day to Potiphar's house, to the palace, trying to do his work and having to avoid Potiphar's wife because she was trying to seduce him. And 
folks, this isn't just any kind of temptation. This was a great temptation, especially on this particular day. Why? Well, because the Bible says that everyone was out. All the soldiers, all the guards were out. It was just Joseph, and it was Joseph with, hear this now, Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Somebody say Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife. Say it again. Wife. One more time. Wife. And she was a, she was attractive. Every day coming at him. Finally, one day she says, I'm going to go to sleep with you now. She grabbed him. She pulled him to her. He managed to get away. He ran out. How many of you know that with every temptation, God will make a way of escape? The way of escape was the door. Some of you all are trying to be very spiritual, looking for a way of escape. And sometimes the way of escape is just walking out, leaving the scene, leaving. Amen? Come on, why don't you just try this, get high, whatever the case may be. You know what? Sometimes it's better to just leave. Is there an amen in the house? Come on, is there an amen in the house? So what ends up happening? The Bible says that she felt rejected. She felt embarrassed. And so she started shouting and saying, because she had his coat in her hands, she started saying, hey, hey, guards, guards. The guards came out of nowhere. They came to her. She said, this young slave boy here, this Hebrew, he tried to rape me. And then the Bible says that she went to her, her husband, which was Potiphar. She told Potiphar. And the Bible says that when Potiphar heard that Joseph, whom he had trusted, had tried to violate his own wife, the Bible says he was enraged with anger. And he ordered that Joseph be thrown into prison. Joseph was in prison for not one month, not two months, not a year, not two years, not even five years, not even eight, seven, ten, twelve. He was in prison for 13 years. In those 13 years, God raised him up even in the prison. And now he had favor with the prison warden. And now he was in charge of all of the prisoners in the prison. Come on, does anybody see the favor of God? Now you might say, it doesn't look like favor because he was accused and now he's in prison. But I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter what the devil tries to do against you. God will cause you to rise up even in the most dire circumstances. Even when others look at you and say, look, poor you, poor little old you. Listen, God's favor is still in your life. Well, the Bible says something very interesting. It says that in prison there was a cupbearer and there was a baker. Everybody say a cupbearer cup and the baker. The cupbearer was the one who would drink before the king would drink. So he was, in essence, protecting the king. So he, everything had to pass through him. But he was in prison because he enraged the Pharaoh. And now he finds himself in prison and also the baker. They were both in charge. These weren't just anybody. These were the men in charge of all the cupbearers, in charge of all the bakers. And watch this. The Bible says that they both had a dream. The dream of the first one, which was the cupbearer, was a dream that when it was interpreted by Joseph, Joseph said, this is what your dream means. He says, you're going to be restored back to your former position. And you're going to be serving the Pharaoh once again his dream. And then the, the baker thought, well, that's a very good interpretation. Let me tell you my dream. And so the baker says his dream, but Joseph's interpretation 
is far different. Joseph tells the baker, and you, in three days, you're going to be hung. You're going to be put to death. The baker must have said, well, that's, that's, that's some messed up interpretation there. <laughs> well, it so happens that they came, they took the cupbearer, took the baker. The cupbearer, sure enough, was restored back to his position, and the baker was put to death. I'm going to show you what that meant, spiritually speaking, as it relates to Jesus. But watch this. I want to make this known to you today. The Bible teaches us that we will all go through difficulties in our life. Somebody say difficulties. And the devil will try to destroy your life. There is a very real enemy. And this very real enemy is against and wants to come against your marriage. He wants to come against your children. He wants to come against your business, your finances. Every aspect of your life that can possibly bring glory to God, the devil wants to destroy. Jesus revealed it very clearly. He said the devil comes. I like that because Jesus did not mince words, but he was very clear. He said the devil comes. Why did he say the devil comes? Because he'll always come. The enemy will always come into every single one of your lives. Not just Pastor Daniel. Not just Pastor Rich. Not just Pastor Dennis. Not just Pastor uh, Tony. Not just uh, our wives. Not just who are also pastors. But not, not just people in ministry. He comes to you as well. The devil comes and Jesus said what he comes to do. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So if, there's, if there are things dying in your life, hear me now, that are causing pain and havoc. I'm talking about things that are not supposed to die. Such as your marriage. Maybe your love for your wife is dying. Maybe your love for uh, ministry is dying. Maybe your uh, affection is dying for something or someone that God wants you to express the love of God toward. There are things that die in our life. Maybe it's a business that's dying. Maybe it's an emotional uh, situation. You feel like you're dying emotionally. Whatever your circumstance or your situation is, the devil is behind it. He wants to cause you to die. If not physically, he wants you to die emotionally. Or he wants you to die spiritually. Or he wants you to die in one aspect or another. So the devil comes to what? kill but he also comes to do what steal so what is it that's being robbed from you what is it that is you feel like man uh, I feel like I, 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 I take one step forward and two steps back my peace is gone I feel no peace anymore I feel no joy anymore why because the devil comes to steal what is it that he does listen he will wait for something in your life to be neglected. Because whenever you are neglected, in neglecting something, the devil comes to take it from you. You'll never have anything stolen right in front of your eyes. You might say, Pastor, people steal things all the time in front of people's eyes. No, no, no. That's called robbing you. Robbing you is bold face action. I'll rob you in front of you. Amen. I'll hold you up. I'll put a gun or a knife and I'll rob you. But I'm not stealing it. I'm robbing you. Stealing it is when you are unaware. Stealing it is when you've neglected something. When you left something somewhere and someone saw that, they'll steal it, leave, you come back and it's gone. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And the devil in many of your lives is stealing things. Why? Because you're neglecting them. You're neglecting the peace of God. You're neglecting the word of God. You're neglecting your ministry. You're neglecting your devotion. You're neglecting your prayer life. You're neglecting your worship. You're neglecting your time with God. You're neglecting it. And when you neglect it, the devil comes to, everybody say, steal. steal. Say it again. Say it again. Steal. 
What's the third one? Destroy. That's the ultimate. Destruction is the ultimate weapon of the enemy. Hear me. He wants it completely destroyed. Because if he kills something, it can still be resurrected. If he steals something, it can still be recovered. But if he destroys something, it's gone. It's gone. So the enemy not just wants to kill things in your life, but he wants to steal and ultimately destroy. I've seen marriages destroyed. I've seen businesses destroyed. I've seen relationships, mother, daughter, mother, son, father, daughter, father, son, relationships destroyed. I've seen so many ravages that the enemy has left behind. Watch this. God allowed the suffering of Joseph. Hold on. Hold on. You need to get this. Because somebody is a Joseph here today. I'm speaking to some Joseph here today. I'm speaking to a Joseph online right now. That's watching me. And you're asking, why am I going through what I'm going through? This is why you're going through it. Because some way, somehow, God is going to use this for the benefit of others. Now, I know that doesn't sound too good. Because you're saying, why am I the scapegoat? Why am I the one having to go through it? Maybe it's because God knows what he's put on the inside of you. And he knows he's put a fight on the inside of you. And he knows that he's put something on the inside of you that is relentless. That is not going to simply say, I'm, I'm done. I'm through. Is there an amen in the house? Watch this. Can you put this, please? Genesis 50 verse 20. Come on. Genesis 50 verse 20. Put that scripture up. I want you guys to help me read this. Is that all right? Yeah. Genesis 50, 50 verse 20. Quickly. Praise the Lord. All right. Come on. One, two, three. You intended. The saving of many lives. Did you see that? This, come on somebody, give God a praise. Hold on, hold on. You intended to harm me, but God intended it. In other words, the same thing that you thought was meant to harm you, God says that it is really meant to bless you. It is meant to save others. It is meant to be a testimony and a witness. It is meant to serve you. It is meant to serve your family. It is meant to serve my family, declares the Lord. You intended it to harm me, but God intended it for what? Good. Watch this now. Colossians 1.24. Quickly, quickly. Colossians 1.24. Watch this. This is powerful stuff. Hallelujah. These are principles from the life of Joseph. Principles to live by. Understanding and revelation. Colossians 1.24 says what? Now I rejoice in what I am what? In what I am what? Suffering. Say it louder. In what I am what? Suffering. For you. And I fill up my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction for the sake of what? His body, which is the church. I like this version here. It says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Paul was saying, what I'm going through, I'm going through not just for me, but I'm going through this for your sake. Is there an amen in the house? Sometimes God will allow you to go through things for somebody else's sake. 
And I know you might say, man, that's not fair. But I'm going to tell you something. In heaven, when you get to heaven one day, there's going to be a reward waiting for you in heaven. And it's not a temporary reward. It's an eternal reward. It is not just something you're going to forget about, but it is something you're going to constantly be reminded about. That what you went through here on the earth, what you had to suffer, what you went through that you thought was going to destroy you, was going to kill you. Come on somebody. It, it, it served to be a blessing to many that will one day share in the worship and in the praise in heaven. Come on somebody. Because of your suffering, because of what you went through, because of your witness, because of your testimony, because of my God, because of your faith that was demonstrated before the people somebody say amen Woo! my God pastor Daniel why did you go through that problem and that difficulty in your marriage 12 years ago when it seemed like everything was done and over with. Because it was going to serve the many that would be impacted by my story. And it was going to infuse hope in the marriages that thought that they too were done and over with. Is there an amen? And they're going to look at Pastor Daniel and say, if God did it with him, I know surely he will do it with me. If God raised him up and her up, he is able to raise us up as well. Somebody, to say, somebody say amen. amen. Wow. What does... Whatever trial you're going through right now, my time is up. But there's another thing we learned from the story of, of Joseph. And it's that God turns evil into good when our suffering causes us to seek, causes us. Uh, 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 uh. Listen, listen. When our suffering causes us to seek God more. I remember there was a, a man who was married and his wife wanted to leave him. And she got up and left, period. And I'm not talking about my situation. This was another person. And I remember that Every time we opened the church, he was the first one there. When we had prayer nights, where we would gather to pray collectively as a church, he was the first one there, the closest to the altar, and the loudest at the altar, crying out, crying out. In fact, in all the years I had known him, I had never seen him as close to God as when he was going through that marital situation. Not only was he close to God in proximity as it relates to the altar and coming and in prayer, but then he was also always, that's all he spoke about, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the word of God became so real to him. And you couldn't talk to him about just any conversation, the weather, or how are you, or how's your day, how's your job, nothing. He didn't want to entertain any conversation other than the God's word, other than the promise of God, other than what God was revealing to him. I thought to myself, wow, this dude is on fire. He is set ablaze. All of a sudden... His wife comes back. And there's a rec reconciliation. God answers his prayer, man. God answered the cry of his heart. And God caused there to be a total shift in her heart. And then after she didn't love him and didn't want to be with him, all of a sudden she fell in love with him again. They got back together. Fantastic. They were together coming to church. 
After a few weeks, he would miss. Every so often, missing service. Prayer, no longer was he at the altar. Now he was in the seats. Then after some time, he wasn't coming to prayer. And I would call him up. I'm like, dude, what's up, man? What's up? You were so on fire, hungry for God, seeking the Lord, worshiping, praising, quoting scripture. Now you're missing, you're shining based on your absence instead of your, 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 your presence being here. Now you're, you're shining with your absence. You're not even here, man. What's up? I said, you know what's up? I told him. I said, you know what's up? What's up is that now you are not as desperate for God as you were when your wife was gone. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Church, listen to me and those of you online. Beware and be careful when you are on the mountaintop of victory and everything is going well and everyone is loving you and everyone's talking well about you. Be very, very careful. Because that's when you're most vulnerable. That's why Paul... When he's administering discipline in the church, he writes to the church at, at Corinth and says, you know this guy? Yeah, 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 the one that's sleeping with his father's wife, his stepmother. He said, L just know this, I've already judged the situation and I've given him over to Satan. How would you like me praying that over you? <laughs> who's cold in the church? Who's lukewarm? Who's playing around? Who's coming every so often? Mm, Lord, give him over to Satan. But you know why Paul said that? He said, so that he can learn and his soul be saved. And then go in and restore him and bring him back. I don't have to pray God give him up to Satan because God has a way of bringing trouble into our lives. That's right, that's right, that's right. I said it. How can you make that negative confession, Pastor? Uh, because the Bible shows me that um, great men suffered for the sake of others and great men suffered because of their own stupidity. Is there an amen in the house? I like what David says in the scriptures. God, don't bless me so much that I forget about you. But don't bless me so little that I curse you. Give me just enough to keep me well balanced. Come on. To keep my heart in check. To keep my heart in check. I'm going to finish this message next week. Everybody stand to your feet. But I need your undivided attention. Don't check out right now. Please, please, please. Because I got to make a correlation. That's powerful. Remember I said that Joseph was a type of Jesus? Everybody say that on the count of three. One, two, three. Joseph was a type of Jesus. Listen to me very carefully. Those of you that love your Bibles and love to read and have been going through the Bible this year. This is so powerful. The Bible says that Joseph, who is a type of Jesus Christ, was in prison and there he had a cupbearer and the baker. Jesus, on the night he was going to be betrayed, thrown into prison, he had a cup. That cup, he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Everybody say blood. blood. 
Don't forget that. The cup is a type of his blood. And then he said, he took the bread. And he said, this bread is my body, which is given up for you. Joseph, hear this now. Joseph says to the cupbearer before he was released, hey, remember me. Jesus tells his disciples, whenever you drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. In other words, remember me. Watch this. The Bible says that the cup bearer was set free. Why? Because it's the blood that sets men free. It's the blood that sets men free. It's the blood that sets men that are condemned to die, condemned to death, and sets them free. It is the cup of the blood of the New Testament. Why did the baker die? Because the baker or the bread he makes is a type of the body. Jesus had to die so that he can pay for the penalty of all of our sins. Jesus' body died. You and I, our body, we have to die to the flesh. Are you listening to me? But it's only partaking of the cup that gives us life. Somebody say amen. Isn't that powerful? I love the correlations that the Bible, and this is the thing about the Bible. That is the proof, the proof among so many other proofs that the Bible was not written by man, but written by God, inspired by God. Because these two accounts were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, thousands of years apart. But Jesus fulfilled. Those of you that are here right now, I'm going to make a call, an altar call right now. And I'm calling those that are in a battle right now for their life. You're in a battle in your marriage. You're in a battle spiritually, personally. You're in a battle. The devil has come to kill. Some of you are in a killing stage right now in your life. Things are being killed. Things are, are dying. Things are being, are, are, are literally, literally, the life being sucked out of your marriage, sucked out of your, your children, sucked out of your finances. Right now, you're in a battle for your life. Some of you, the devil has come to steal. He stole your joy, your peace. You've been full of anxiety, worry. Thoughts of suicide are flooding your mind. My God, the devil is trying to, dis to destroy your life. That's his ultimate goal. But this is what God is saying to you today. What the enemy has intended for evil against you, the Lord says, I will turn it around for your good. You may not see it, you may not realize it, you may not know, and you might think it's been going on for a long time. 13 years, Joseph was in the prison. 13 years jo Joseph was in the prison. He was finally let go. The Bible says that the cupbearer remembered him. The cupbearer remembered him. He was able to go out free, interpret Pharaoh's dream, and the Bible says that Pharaoh was so impressed that he made Joseph the head, the Potiphar, the head of the entire nation he told Joseph no one is greater than you except me but I put you in charge of my entire kingdom Egypt everything the wealth everything is under your hands did Joseph see that coming no Joseph didn't see that coming but his suffering made sense after he was walking in the fulfillment of his prophecy, of his dreams. And I'm going to tell you something. Some of you here, 
are suffering but you don't realize because God has called you to be a pastor. God has called you to be a prophet. God has called you to be an apostle. God has called you to be a teacher in the body of Christ. And you don't understand the process right now. You don't understand why things have been difficult lately. Why things have been hard lately. Why is it they've been talking about you lately? Why is it you've been going through what you've been going through lately? Why your marriage has been in a strain? Come on! It's because of your purpose! It's because of your call. When I count to three, I want to see anybody here who knows they're in a battle for their lives. We're not playing games with you, devil. You're a liar and a deceiver. And Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus. From off of every person, every mind, every emotion in this building right now. I take spiritual jurisdiction against every attempt for physical suicide, spiritual suicide, emotional suicide, marital suicide. One, two, the moment I count to three, don't wait, just run up here. And if you hesitate, then you're not desperate enough, and that's fine. You can be there. Maybe this is not for you. Three right now, just come on, come on, come on, in the name of Jesus. Come on, raise up, raise up, raise up, raise up the... The music. Sina Masoto Reshende Rebesa. Hasta Castarava Sharra Vasaya. Yes. Anamakator Reshetele Diasa. My God. My God. How is it that I have survived? How is it that I have made it through 43 years in the Lord? Through my years of development, my years of rebuke and correction, how is it that I have made it through the trials in my life that would otherwise have killed me? How is it that I stand before you today? It's because God's plans and purposes have never changed for me even when I was in the furnace of affliction even when I was going through my trial even when I've been tempted to give up and what God did with me He is more than sufficient to do with you extend your hands over here church and I want you to stand with these beautiful people on this altar. This is a day of victory. This is not a day of defeat. And this is a day of victory. This, wasn't not, this was not the message I was going to bring today. But the Lord changed everything in the last minute. And I believe it was for you. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We break the powers of hell. We break the powers of the enemy. We destroy every work, everything the devil has intended for evil against you, man. God says, I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to turn it around for your good and for the good of your family. Woo, Lord. My God. Hallelujah. Even Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the cross which seemed to be the greatest tragedy in history, became 
the greatest victory in history, the greatest victory the world has ever seen. Shh. Because what the devil intended for evil against Jesus, the Father turned it around for the salvation of many. Hey, my God, there it is. There's an anointing right now. My God! Yes. Yes, heal, deliver right now. Set free. Set free. Set free. Set free. Woo. My God. My God. My God. My God. My God. Hey, hey, hey. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. There's no devil in hell that can withstand the spirit of the living God. God said, I've sealed you with the Holy Ghost. I have sealed you. Holy anointing. Holy anointing. Spirit of the living God, I break every power of hell, every mind game of the enemy, every deception in the name of Jesus. My God, my God, in the name of Jesus. Bless him, Lord God. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, right now, right now, right now, we break the powers of the enemy. We break the powers of hell. We command it out of here in the name of Jesus. Right now, we declare the blood of Jesus over these people, the blood of Jesus. Huh. And I say, Satan, come out. Devil, come out. Unclean spirits, come out. Come out. Come out, come out, come out of every person in this place. Come out right now of every person on this altar, everyone in their seats, in the name of Jesus. Come out! Hey, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. God's there. The Holy Ghost. Shh. Oh my God, there's a presence right now. There's a presence of God. There's a presence of God right now. Hallelujah. 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 In Amasambirebeshe. Nasakata Rabase. Come out. Come out. The Sekata Rama Shete Rebesiriose. Esha Rama Sandele Reshe. Masom Brom de Re. Masiketi Riashekele de Reza. Ah, 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 ah. Hey, hey. Catolobo Setele Shelelelia. Ay, 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 gracias Padre En el nombre de Jesús Ahora mismo, ahora mismo atamos todo diablo, todo mentiroso Ahora mismo de la mente, de las emociones Ahora mismo, en el nombre Llena, llena, llénala, 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 llénala Llénala, 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 llénala En el nombre de Jesús Fill her, fill her, fill her, fill her, fill her, Jesus Fill her, God, fill her, fill her, fill her Fill her, fill her In the name of Jesus, fill her Fill her. Shh. 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 Ah, llénalo, Señor. Gracias, Padre. Gracias, Señor, por este matrimonio. Venimos en contra de todo lo que venga en contra de ellos. En el nombre de Jesús, en el nombre de Jesús. Shikalabasa te remende. Strosheria. Raman de Breish. Eh, fire, fire, fire. Holy fire. Holy fire. Holy fire, holy fire, consume, consume. Now fill God. Fill, fill. We bind every unclean thing, every, every foul thing in the name of Jesus. My God, we thank you. We thank you, dear God, that what you, dear Lord, woo, what you're doing, dear God, and what you will yet even continue to do, Ooh, it's beyond what he has even thought, contemplated, or even expected, God. Shh. Woo. For behold, I set your feet upon solid ground, declares the Lord. 
I set your feet upon solid ground. You have a new name, a new name in glory. Woo! Woo! My God. Man, there's a presence of God. There's an anointing right now in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my God. If I can get some pastors to lay hands, come on. Start on the, on the opposite end. Just go. Just go lay hands. Lay hands in the name of Jesus. Pastors, come on. In the mighty name of Jesus. Mm. My God. My God. The Lord says there's an assignment against your life, against your, 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 your marital life, and even, even your family as a whole. And that assignment has been dispatched from hell itself. And the Lord says, fear not, my daughter, fear not, my son, fear not. For the Lord says, I am putting a stop to the advances of the enemy. I am putting a stop, a stop on the advancement of the enemy. But the Lord says it's going to require, it's going to require man of God, it's going to require a new diet, says the Lord. This diet is not a physical diet, but a spiritual diet. The Lord says it's going to require that you digest my word, that you that you begin to break it into pieces and digest it for it is going to give you the strength you need to stand up boldly in the middle of your household and declare the enemy to leave God says that when the strong man comes in he must be bound and God says I've given you the authority to bind on earth what will be bound in the heavens and I've given you the authority to loose on the earth loose in your family what the enemy has tried to rob and to steal hey rise up in your authority man of God rise up in your authority man of God rise up Woo. For when the enemy would tell you, it's done, it's over, God says, I have not yet begun. You have not yet begun to see what I'm getting ready to do in your entire house. In your entire house. My God, there's a presence of God here right now. There's an anointing right now. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Ah, my God. We break the powers of hell. What the enemy has intended for evil against you. I shall turn it around for your good, declares the Lord. But God says a new level of awakening. A new level of awakening. A new level of awakening. In fact, I hear the Lord say, there are people that, spiritually speaking, are like the one that wakes up from a deep sleep. And even though they're awake, they're still In the first stage of their being woken up and so certain things they're not fully aware of their senses are not all yet in a heightened awareness yet they're awake but then after some time you become fully awake 
your awareness is heightened. Your sensitivity, your surroundings, your agility, your strength is back. The Lord says, I'm taking you to a new level of awakening. A new level of awakening. I'm going to heighten your awareness. Heighten your sensitivity to the things of the Spirit. You're not going to be in that first stage woke position. Oh my God, thank you Holy Spirit. Ooh, there's a presence, a presence, an anointing right now. Pray leaders, pray. There's a holy fire in this place right now. Holy fire. Holy fire. Holy fire. Holy fire, fall down on me. Fall down on me. Holy fire. Holy fire, fall on me now. Fall on me now. Holy one. He's here right now. Holy fire. Holy fire. The Bible says, Is there any sick among you? Let them come to the elders of the church and anointing them with oil, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. So, I'm anointing a precious brother here, Pastor Rich. And we're going to declare the word of faith right now. The prayer of faith will heal. It doesn't say it might heal. It says it will heal the sick. Amen. So, Father, I lay my hands on your servant according to your word and in line with your instructions. Ooh, man, I feel the presence of God right now. The healing power of God is flowing. And Lord, you know exactly what he was either exposed to physically, chemically, in whatever circumstance or situation at work. And Father, right now I declare him healed from the top of his head. Right now, restore all cognitive ability anything right now affected in his bloodstream right now in his respiratory system circulatory system right now in the name of Jesus I declare right now that everything even his neurological system father right now I declare whole in Jesus name father I pray for every pH balance right now to return back to normality, every electromagnetic frequency in his body to return right now into sync in Jesus name I declare right now wholeness from the top of his head down to his feet healed healed restored made whole Woo. Woo. oh my god my god my God, there's a, there's, a, there's a river flowing right now. It's like a faucet that's flowing right now. It's flowing over your head on down, through your shoulders on down, on down, on down, through your legs on down. Ah, healing is the children's bread. Healing is the children's bread. Ah, 
I not only took your sickness on the cross, declares the Lord. I took your infirmities, every, anything, everything associated. I took your sin and your sickness. Woo, my God, in Jesus' name. Woo, amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. It's done in Jesus' name. Just raise up your hands, everybody, everybody. Those of you online, just raise up your hand right where you are. Right where you are. And I declare healing from the top of your head down to your feet. I speak to cancer. I'm a cancer survivor. I speak to cancer and I command cancer to be gone, cancer to be healed, breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. Right now, cancer. Cancer in the blood, lupus. Right now, cancer. Cancer in the lymph nodes, cancer. Every thymoma healed in the name of Jesus. Right now, bone cancer healed in Jesus' name. Right now, in Jesus' name, every cell in your body whole and healed. I speak to your heart. Every artery healed right now. Cleansed of calcium, cleansed of calcium obstruction right now in Jesus' name. Healed right now in Jesus' name. I speak to fatty liver disease. I speak healing to your fatty liver disease. And I speak a whole healed liver now in Jesus' name. I speak to your kidneys, wholeness, healing right now to your kidneys. In Jesus' name. Hey! I feel an anointing in this place. Somebody just raise up your hands. Close your eyes. Come on, we're in the presence of God. Raise up the music. Come on, we're in the presence of a holy anointing. We're in the presence of a holy anointing. Receive it right there where you are. Right in your room, in your living room. Right now, sitting with your family. Right now, there in your living room. Come on, right now. Receive it. 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 I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing in this place. I feel the anointing falling over me. I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing coming over me. I 
I feel the anointing. Can somebody say that? I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing falling over me. Somebody say it. I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing falling over me. Oh, thank you, Lord. I feel anointing. Go ahead. I feel anointing. I feel the anointing falling, falling over me. Oh, thank you, Lord. I feel. Oh, thank you, Lord. Say it again. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I feel the anointing falling over me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Well, come on. Let's give Jesus a clap offering in this place. Amen. good you happy you came today you all happy you came today amen come on all right well faith world just want to make an announcement and that is that this coming Wednesday we're here again many of you have come out God bless you those of you that have come out you know you were blessed 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 this past Wednesday make sure you come out again it's so important especially if you're in leadership good Lord you should be here. Get to the house of God. Amen. We have the youth, young people, young people. I miss, I miss, we had a great, we had a great group of young people this past Wednesday, but I still missed a few of you that weren't there. Amen. So make sure you make it out to the house. Somebody say amen. 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 God is good. This is what I want you to do before we dismiss. I want you to find somebody and hug Come on, love on them, hug their neck. Come on, in the name of Jesus. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you all this Wednesday night.